today, October 22, is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Welcome to the Adventist History Podcast. This episode is called Vietnam. Last time we talked about the 1960s in the Adventist Church. It was a time of great success in terms of baptisms and institution building, but also a time of tension where an increasingly educated and concerned class of Adventists began asking questions which church leaders did not seem to want to address. Questions which had been around for decades. And many of these concerned Adventists appreciated Ellen White, but had questions about the nature of her inspiration, her literary borrowing, and other topics. Now, before we get into this episode, I have something I want to say. You should probably be sitting down for this. Maybe you're mowing the lawn. Just leave the lawnmower on and sit down in the grass. Okay, here goes. This episode marks the first in our final countdown to the end of season two. That's right. This show should wrap up in about 12 months. This coming December 2023 is when we should start dealing with the Desmond Ford controversy. That will take a few months. Then I'll do a quick episode to get us from there to about 2015. And then in March or April of 2023, I'll do a recap episode and just talk about some of the things I learned having done this show for what will have been close to 10 years. Now, that won't be the end of everything. However, after I finish season two, I plan to go back and re-record season one, adding a lot of information that I didn't know nine years ago, upgrading audio quality, fixing mistakes, and things like that. I won't be re-recording season one on any kind of schedule. Sometimes I might get five episodes done in a week, sometimes zero, but I hope to finish that up by the fall of 2024, which will be the 10-year mark of this show. Well, what about after that? Well, after that, I'm going to take a break because I've been doing this month after month after month, not having missed a single month in what will have been 10 years. So yeah, I'm going to take a month off and then I'll start working on future seasons. Now, future seasons will at this point be on themes or topics in Adventist history, like on women or missions in Asia or whatever, maybe the development of some doctrine. And they will probably be released weekly for a while. And so we'll have season three, let's say it's on a topic. We get an episode each week for, let's say, two months, and then I'll take some months off as I work on the next season. So it's not going to be a monthly podcast. It'll be in in bursts, in seasons, or well, properly seasons. The way we do seasons in here is, as you've noticed, not really seasonal. It's more of a season one is till Ellen White dies, and season two is everything else, right? I've spent eight years, eight and a half years doing this each and every month. It's been a rhythm that has worked for me. It's helped me so I didn't get burned out because it was a it was a manageable schedule. But it would be nice to try a different rhythm and not look at the 22nd of every month with anxiety about needing to produce another episode. Besides, I have other creative projects I want to do, both inside and outside of Adventist history. So I'm not going anywhere. Anyways, I could talk for a half hour about this. We can make a whole episode about this. And honestly, just take all of this with, I don't want to say a grain of salt as if I'm deceiving you, but what I'm trying to say is that plans can change. I'm not giving you a hard and fast date when things end. I may rethink the whole season idea, but that's just where I'm at. Right now, I wanted to let you know right now, it's just there on the horizon. And I just want to say now, as I'm sure I'm going to say at the end, it has been a great journey with you. I'm not crying. You're crying. Okay. We've got work to do. Let's go. In April 1975, with communist forces closing in on the capital of Saigon, John Van finally decided to leave Vietnam with his parents and three brothers and head for America. It was impossible to take everything the family owned. John had to choose between a suitcase 
in his Yamaha guitar. He took the guitar, of course. Now, John was not his birth name. It was a name he took like many people do when they come to America and realize that Americans can't pronounce anything. So he picked John, and it was an homage to his hero, John Lennon. Lennon had been one of the loudest voices in opposition to the war in Vietnam. But by the time John Van arrived in America, Lennon was baking bread and staying home with his new son, embarking on a five-year hiatus from making music. John Van formed a band with his brothers and a cousin called Van Asia, playing traditional Vietnamese music along with the usual songs about girls and the good life. Back home, their father had worked for the Vietnam Publishing House along with, it seems, other family members. In America, John's father scrubbed pots and pans at Florida Hospital, an Adventist institution. John's mother had been a nurse at an Adventist hospital in Vietnam, but in America, she packaged medical supplies also for Florida Hospital. The family escaped the Vietnam War, but they had fallen far from where they had once been in terms of economic and social status. John had been offered a scholarship to the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, but turned it down because he didn't want to leave his parents. Or, as he put it, quote, My parents, they left the country for us. They're just like children here. They don't understand America. We try to stay close to them because if they don't have us, they don't have anything. End quote. What I love about this story of the Van family is its simplicity, but also its complexity. There are so many ways of looking at it. There's the war and how it hurts people and displaces them. There's an angle here of how the Adventist church can leverage its global reach to help evacuate families like the Vans out of a war-torn country and even help provide them with a job elsewhere, or at least opportunities for a job. Then there's the angle of the refugee life in America. Many of these Vietnamese refugees, and especially Adventists, their first stop in America would be a gymnasium at Loma Linda University. <laughs> That's where they would sleep for a little while before they could we could find a place for them somewhere in the country. There's the, the angle of uh, the difficulty of fitting in as an immigrant, as a refugee, the loss of economic and social status, and the preservation of the Vietnamese family values despite this displacement, this disruption. We could also talk about how American music might have caused John Van to be at odds with many American Adventists who certainly didn't see John Lennon in perhaps the same light that he did. They might have labeled John Lennon worldly in, by association, Van's band, Van Asia. Like I said, there's a lot of angles from which to look at this story, as simple as it may appear. But whatever this experience meant for the Van family, the story itself isn't consequential for the history of Adventism. You'd be forgiven for never having heard it. I don't know that it was ever published in an Adventist paper. The band, Van Asia, didn't seem to last very long. The Vans should have started a shoe line focused on skateboard culture, and I have it on very good authority that they could have made some serious money. But while the story of the Vans and their band and their not going into the shoe business doesn't really put a dent into Adventist history, it is a good microcosm of how Adventists related to the Vietnam War. Of course, the story of Adventism in the Vietnam War is the story of Adventist soldiers, People usually talk about the Vietnam War from a military or a social or a political perspective. People died or they returned home scarred. And meanwhile, back in the United States, it is a story of protests and resistance music. Politicians of this era are judged based on how they handled the war. But what about the people on the battlefields who weren't soldiers? What about the Adventist school teacher in Vietnam, the publisher, the missionary doctor? What about the local Adventist church? This episode is about these stories. Stories of families like the Vans, but also stories of Adventists in the military, medics, pilots, and how the civilian and military families were affected by this conflict. But let's begin by refreshing our memory about the Vietnam War and what it was all about Okay, the Vietnam War was essentially a civil war which got hijacked by foreign powers, mostly America in the end, 
The Vietnamese, of course, don't call it the Vietnam War, they call it the American War, and neither title is completely accurate. After World War II, France tried to reassert control over Vietnam, but was defeated by a guy named Ho Chi Minh. The French negotiated an exit, with the country being divided at the 17th parallel, the north belonging to the communists and the south belonging to this new republic. Well, there were supposed to be elections in 1956 that would hopefully reunify the country peacefully, but the president of South Vietnam knew that the more populous north would win, so he resisted having elections. And that caused North Vietnam to begin trying to undermine the South Vietnamese regime, and these guerrilla warriors became known as the Viet Cong, short for Vietnamese Communists. Naturally, all of this alarmed the United States, because everything alarms the United States, who didn't want to see communists fill the vacuum left behind by an allied power, namely France. Something called the domino theory began taking root in America, which was the belief that if one country fell to communism, then so would another and another and another, and so someone had to stop the dominoes from falling. This is the basis for American involvement in Korea. They wanted a South Korea that was that was free from the communist control because they didn't want the communists to take over there, just as they had taken over in China before that, and now they were taking over in Vietnam. We have to stop the dominoes from falling. Now, the CIA warned that this domino theory was dangerous and that America shouldn't get involved in Vietnam. But political leaders, as I said, had watched China fall to the communists. They had watched Korea get invaded by the communists, and now they're watching the same thing happen in Vietnam. America was fresh out of the Korean War, where the injection of immense military might had managed to hold the communists at bay. So why wouldn't the same thing work in Vietnam? Now, ironically, Adventists hadn't particularly enjoyed life under the French or the South Vietnamese government. The South Vietnamese president was Catholic. There was about a 10% Catholic minority in Vietnam at the time. And he used the government and the aid that he was given to benefit Catholics, often to the exclusion of the majority Buddhists or the minority Protestants. The South Vietnamese government threatened to close the Adventist hospital in Saigon. And in 1956, the South Vietnamese government ordered all foreign radio broadcasters to cease in Vietnam. And this inadvertently gave an opening to one Adventist at the Voice of Vietnam station, now that the latter, being a local station, would be given a larger share of airtime. Eager for more radio content in Vietnamese, the Vietnamese Voice of Prophecy host tried to form his own quartet, like the King's Heralds back in America. They practiced, and practiced, he reported, but just weren't good enough. <laughs> That's what actually got printed. <laughs> Ouch. So he asked the famous King's Herald and Del Delker in the United States to sing some hymns in Vietnamese. They had done so in other languages. There was no one, unfortunately, to teach them Vietnamese until an American church leader in Vietnam flew back to the United States, spent a month teaching the King's Heralds and Del Delker how to sing 24 Vietnamese hymns, which definitely sounds easier than finding native Vietnamese singers. The best part of the story to me is that when the recordings of these hymns arrived, the Vietnamese thought a mistake had been made because it sounded like Chinese. <laughs> As our Voice of Prophecy host said, quote, Not until recently did we realize that our Vietnamese language is one of the very hardest languages to pronounce of all the languages in which the King's Heralds have so far sung. End quote. This caused the host to feel a bit of pride that he could do something the Americans couldn't, speak Vietnamese. Now, the 1950s in Vietnam weren't as bad for Adventists as it was for them in South Korea, which even after the ceasefire still maintained the draft without any exemption for non-combatants. And that's because the South Korean president saw his country as part of what he called a holy Christian war against the communists. As he put it, quote, peaceful coexistence is the devil's lie to deceive the uninformed world, end quote. Drafted Korean Adventists were often beaten or sent to prison for refusing to fight years after the actual fighting was over. And of course, they didn't know that it was going to last all this time, that there was going to be uh, that the ceasefire would hold up. So, yeah. One Avenus was beaten so badly he spent a week recovering in a secret military hospital. So Avenus' life in Vietnam in the 1950s was more manageable. The newly appointed medical director at Saigon Avenus Hospital said these were, quote, the most thrilling 16 months of our lives, end quote. 
He could rely upon connections in that great Avenus World Wide Web to get things done. A woman's group in California paid for pipes that would drain the two mosquito-infested ditches next to the hospital and build a parking lot. The same women's group also helped build the morgue. A former American patient at the hospital helped spread mosquito nets over the entire hospital. Another group of women, the American Women's Association of Saigon, helped fund new stoves so people didn't have to cook over open fires, which I'm told is not an ideal thing in a hospital. The nurses and even the medical director himself have been supplied by the Bangkok Sanitarium and the Manila Sanitarium, demonstrating how Avenus institutions could support each other. The president of the Vietnam mission was so pleased with the Filipina nurses that he declared them to be, quote, next best to American trained nurses, end quote. I'm sure he meant that as a compliment, but maybe, maybe don't next time. After the U.S. Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution in 1964, tens of thousands of American military personnel began flooding into Vietnam. Plenty of American voices urged caution, and the first large anti-war protest took shape as troops were mobilizing for Vietnam. But Lyndon Johnson thought he could win the war decisively and quickly, a conceit shared by more than one American commander-in-chief in history. The first U.S. ground troops arrived in March 1965, consisting of 3,500 Marines from the 3rd Marine Division in Okinawa. Their task was to secure an airfield for future operations. The rest of the division would follow by the end of the year. J.H. Hancock, an associate secretary in the General Conference's Missionary Volunteer Department, in other words, Youth Ministry, visited Okinawa to talk to the Avenus Marines who were about to be deployed to Vietnam. The Avenus boys were uneasy. Hancock wrote, quote, We prayed and sang together, and during those days, as we discussed their problems, there was a deep heart searching and a strong desire to square up with God. End quote. Some of these Avenus had enlisted rather than following the church's advice to wait until you're drafted and pursue conscientious objector status. And now they regretted it. Hancock went on, quote, When I saw the agony of soul in the moistened eyes of these tall, muscular Marines, I wished I had a magic carpet that could transport every Seventh-day Adventist youth to Okinawa to witness what I was seeing firsthand. In expressing their desire to get right with God, they revealed their innermost thoughts. We are soon going to Vietnam, and we know that some of us are not coming back. End quote. Sure enough, a few months later, on August 27, 1965, an American Adventist soldier was killed in Vietnam when his helicopter crashed. Hancock hadn't known all of their names, and he wondered if this Adventist who died was one of the boys he had talked to. This naturally shook the American Adventist community, and editors of various church papers had to remind them that this boy wasn't the first Adventist to die. Vietnamese Adventists, both civilians and those conscripted, had been dying for some time now. The church in Vietnam pressed on. In October 1965, church leaders held a rally in Saigon for literature evangelists. 30 people showed up. Church leaders then met with a group of Adventists in Da Nang, 65 miles from North Vietnam. The Adventist church there was near the airport, so they worshipped. And as they worshipped, they could hear the American B-57 Canberra bombers roaring into the sky nearby, prowling for somebody to kill. 200 literature evangelists in Vietnam were, as the division publishing secretary put it, quote, constantly exposed to kidnappings, bombings, and even death, end quote. But nevertheless accomplished more in 1965 than they had in 1964. In 1966, two new churches were dedicated in Vietnam. It might not make sense to you to build and dedicate churches while a war was going on, because they could get blown up at any moment, but this is the weird, paradoxical way of life in a war zone. You can't just wait around for the war to stop. So the church did their thing, selling books, holding stop smoking seminars, all while the war raged on. Perhaps the situation was best put by the American Adventist at the head of the Vietnam mission in the early 1960s. One day, he was hiking through the jungle with an Australian doctor and a Norwegian nurse when they got stopped by the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong soldiers insisted that the Westerners follow them for a lecture. 
The Avenist leader recalled, quote, You never know how long these lectures will last, an hour or two, a week or two, or sometimes forever. When you live in a situation like that, things don't seem too exciting. You just take them for granted, end quote. In other words, you just take each day as it comes. And in case you're wondering, the mission president explained to the Viet Cong that they were headed to a remote village to bring medical supplies, and they were let go after a three-hour lecture on the evils of America, ironically. Taking risks is part of being a missionary. And the mission president once had a baptismal service for 10 people in a canal, and as he was going through the service, soldiers traded small arm fire and artillery fire two miles away in one of innumerable battles in the region. You just have to focus on baptizing these people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in between the booms. The war thus presented unique obstacles, but also unique opportunities. During one stop smoking class at the Saigon Adventist Hospital, a boy of about nine showed up and he was turned away at the door because this isn't a thing for kids, until he admitted that he had been smoking about a pack a day and wanted help stopping. So he and his two friends were able to get that small, significant victory in their lives, even if they had no control over the larger battle that was going on around them. Not long after Robert H. Pearson was elected president of the General Conference in 1966, he took a tour of what the church called the Far Eastern Division. He was something of a celebrity. Landing in Seoul, South Korea, local officials gave him access to a VIP room at the airport, which I can only imagine was a space with as many virgin piña coladas as you could drink. Sorry, I may be projecting myself into that story. Uh, Pearson watched 150 Pathfinders march in front of him before jumping into a private plane to visit some churches. Pearson would go on to visit Japan, Singapore, the Philippines, and Indonesia on his trip. At his stop in Manila, local officials gave him access to the VIP room in that airport as well. Is anybody else wanting a piña colada right now? Anyways, from the airport, two officers on motorcycles escorted the 41-vehicle motorcade to the Union office a few miles away. But Pearson couldn't miss Vietnam on this trip. He had told his aides when planning the trip, quote, Be sure to include Vietnam on my itinerary. I want to see the work there, and I want to meet our servicemen. End quote. Pearson did indeed meet with 60 or 70 Avenist soldiers and encouraged them before attending the baptism of 48 Viet Cong prisoners who had accepted Adventism while in prison in South Vietnam. Wouldn't it be wonderful, Pearson remarked, quote, if all the Viet Cong could be won to Christ, then the war would end, end quote. But the war didn't end, and so over 5,000 American Seventh-day Adventists either enlisted or were drafted and sent to Vietnam, 15% of whom were black Adventists. Of course, we don't know how many Vietnamese or Cambodian or other Avenists were caught up in this conflict, either as civilians or soldiers. But as the war intensified, so did the heroism of Avenist soldiers. A private named Michael Allen was awarded the Bronze Star for heroism. He was one of many decorated Avenists during the war. Allen had been patching up a wounded man and rolled over to help another when leaves three inches from his face began flying as bullets tore through them. When another soldier was wounded, Allen grabbed some morphine, and when suddenly the morphine in his hand was, was exploded as a bullet hit it. A few minutes later, Allen was carrying a wounded man to safety. A bullet struck the wounded man in the head, and his head had been resting on Allen's chest. When all was said and done, 26 men lay dead, 41 were wounded from the battle, and Allen had bullet holes all through his uniform and some of his gear on his back destroyed by enemy fire, but he hadn't been hit. Another Adventist medic was dug in on the shoulder of a mountain. It was Thanksgiving Day, and he was about to write a letter, but decided to go, as he put it, do our thing in the woods. In the process of doing his thing, he happened to tick off some wasps and who kept stinging him over and over and over. His face became swollen and he couldn't write home anymore. So instead, he walked around talking to the other guys. Then mortars began hitting their position out of nowhere. The medic ran for his tent, which is where he would have been if he was writing letters. He wanted to get his medical supplies when it just exploded in front of him and he'd lost everything. If he had been writing those letters, he would have been dead. Speaking of the wasps, he would later say, quote, I have a soft spot in my heart for them now. You have no idea. I claimed the promise of Psalm 91 that whole time. 
the wasps were sent to keep me alive, end quote. Mike Vartenuk's sergeant made fun of him until three days later, Mike showed up to patch up the sergeant's leg and carry him to safety. He ended up with the Bronze Star after pulling two soldiers out of a vehicle on fire. Another Avenus medic acquitted himself so well that his brother became an Avenus back home. Private First Class Fred Villanueva got his Bronze Star pulling wounded men out of a tank even after he got hit by a grenade. The church was proud of its members. Quote, we are proud of our servicemen who, trusting only in spiritual weapons, face danger and death in order to relieve suffering and save life. They are not only a blessing to their fellow men, they also bring honor to God and the truth to which they are committed, end quote. But not every Adventist was so fortunate, of course. A 33-year-old sergeant was killed on his first full day in Vietnam. The Adventist Review once looked into the 150 or so names of Adventist soldiers who died in Vietnam that they could find at the time and found that their average age was 22 and that their average length of time in the country was 151 days, less than five months. Adventist publications at the time, like Herbert Ford's 1968 book, No Guns on Their Shoulders, portrayed Adventists as conscientious objectors. But the Adventist Review found that among those 150 Adventists who died in the war, and doubtless there were many more, 43 died carrying a gun in the army, about a third. Another 17 died doing the same in the Marines. The line was often blurry. Just because you served as an unarmed medic, for instance, didn't mean you couldn't pick up a gun. Specialist James Oliver was treating a wounded paratrooper when he saw a sniper in a tree kill another wounded man. So what was the point of me going around patching all these people up while someone is shooting at them? I saw the sniper, Oliver later said, quote, picked up an M16 off the ground, sighted, and fired once. I hope I don't have to do it again, but if I must, I will, end quote. The sniper, of course, fell out of the tree, presumably dead. Was Oliver now a combatant in the war? Did he sin? Did he give up his conscientious objector status? Presumably, he went on being a medic, not carrying a weapon. Maybe he never fired another one again. What might the church have said? Like I said, the line was often blurry. There were other issues than the combatancy question, of course. One Adventist soldier wrote a glowing letter in Southern Missionary College's now Southern Adventist University, their student paper, The Southern Accent, and he wrote that morale was sky high among U.S. troops and that his role as a medic in a company of evacuation helicopters, Medivac, is remarkably safe. They hadn't had any incidents since his helicopter had last crashed three months before. <laughs> I don't think I'd work at a place that's like no crashes for three months. But if everything was great on the American side, he had nothing good to say about the Vietnamese. Quote, we have to try and stop communism wherever we can which is our only reason for being here. It's just a shame we can't be doing it for people who would seem to be more worth the trouble, end quote. Oof. Whatever American Adventists felt about the war, they did often share their country's fear of communism. In fact, this may have been a major reason why some Adventists chose to bear arms, because communism wasn't just a rival economic system. It represented godlessness, Harry Truman was the first U.S. president to try and unite Christians with the state to oppose communism. After Republicans beat up on Truman's Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, Truman came to his defense as if the fate of the world hung on this political squabble. Quote, If communism were to prevail in the world as it shall not prevail, Dean Acheson would be one of the first, if not the first, to be shot by the enemies of liberty and Christianity. End quote. The enemies of political liberty and Christianity? Hmm. That Avenus letter to the Southern accent decrying the Vietnamese as unworthy of America's sacrifice sounds as if it could have been written by a frustrated missionary. When a recent Southern graduate, 22-year-old Ron DeLong, died in Vietnam, the Chattanooga News Free Press said that he died, quote, to save a people in their land from vicious communist conquest, end quote. It was almost a messianic mission to fight in Vietnam. Not every Avenus soldier believed that they were part of some grand crusade against evil, of course. Most, I would say, were just there out of a sense of duty to their country and a, a broad opposition to communism, perhaps. Uh, 
Some of those medics found themselves spending their time treating local villagers with much needed medication rather than dodging enemy bullets. But the message of Vietnam being this anti-communist crusade did persuade many Adventists. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church did everything it could to prepare its members for the conflict. The Medical Cadet Corps, which had been operating since the 1930s, set up camps for young Adventist men to learn the basics of field medicine and to learn something of military discipline. Hundreds and hundreds of young Adventists attended these camps, and there was a, a, a camp in Michigan called Camp Doss after Desmond Doss, who did make an appearance from time to time. It was believed that, having gone through this training, drafted men would be able to make a better case for being a medic and have a smoother integration into the armed forces. Now, the U.S. military was happy to have these Adventists self-training, and they helped by providing materials, manuals, whatever, to make sure that the training at these camps was truly in harmony with current military practice. The relationship between the American government and the Adventist church made some sense, because from 1940 until Vietnam, more than half of the 1AO conscientious objectors in the military had been Adventist. So I guess we might as well work together. In fact, declaring yourself a conscientious objector and becoming a medic virtually guaranteed that you would be sent to Vietnam and be put in harm's way. They needed medics badly, and that wasn't the way to go if you were simply scared or were trying to get out of your duty. Of course, there were Adventists who refused to go to Vietnam at all. One Adventist in the U.S. Naval Academy resigned. Quote, I asked myself if it was possible for a born-again Christian to be involved in wholesale slaughter and mass destruction, end quote. A student at Southern, mulling over the 1968 presidential election, concluded, quote, if I were to vote in a primary today, I would vote for Eugene McCarthy. As a Seventh-day Adventist pacifist, I am anxious to see the ridiculous slaughter in Vietnam stopped, end quote. Yet this student's classmates didn't share his views. In a student mock poll that actually took place across the nation, including on several Adventist campuses, Nixon got 72% of the vote at Southern. Interestingly, some guy named Ronald Reagan got the fewest votes on campus. Well, I'm sure he'll never amount to anything. After Jimmy Carter was elected president, he pardoned thousands of men who had refused to go to Vietnam. One student at Union College appreciated that. The Vietnam War shamed our country, Ed Christian wrote. Quote, I praise those who were Christ-like enough, cowardly enough, or whatever, to resist induction, and I would have joined them had it been necessary, end quote. While there were no major protests of the war on Adventist campuses, unlike other campuses in America at the time, some Adventists did participate in protests against the war. But Adventist periodicals were even less willing to publicize the anti-war movement in America, or at least Adventist involvement in it, I should say, than they were to talk about Adventist soldiers who were carrying guns in Vietnam. Occasionally, an article would criticize the anti-war movement in America, which was widely vilified by establishment types as being pro-communist, pro-drugs, and anti-Christian even. And of course, there were elements of that in the anti-war movement, but that wasn't the whole story. Adventist editors seemed to have committed themselves to a public posture of patriotism and brand loyalty. They didn't, to my knowledge, herald the war as a good thing. They weren't 100% into, yes, we need to fight, this is a just war, blah, 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 blah. But neither did they publicly debate it. A good Adventist supported his or her country as a conscientious objector, saving lives in Vietnam. It was the job of church members on the home front to pray for and support these soldiers and missionaries and believers in Vietnam, not to question the war. Some Adventists did protest or refused to show up for the draft or insisted that they were pacifists on account of their Adventism. And so we had a, a, a slight movement in America that, that recommitted itself to opposing any kind of service in war, not merely as a conscientious objector, but it didn't make many waves in Adventism at the time. Why risk this good relationship with the U.S. government that the church had cultivated for decades to finally get to the point where Adventist convictions about fighting were more or less understood and even valued by the government? I mean, look at Operation White Coat as an example of that relationship. Operation White Coat was, of course, the Army's medical testing program with largely Adventist volunteers. The Army built that relationship with Seventh-day Adventist leaders, where conscientious objectors 
who didn't want to go to Vietnam at all could head instead to Fort Detrick for testing. What kind of tests? Well, human trials were needed to develop the right vaccine for Q fever, for instance. The Avena soldiers in that program helped save lives down the road when proven vaccines could be deployed to protect people, including in the Gulf War. I would normally say a lot about White Coat in this episode because several thousand Avenists actually joined the program, but I've kind of already said a lot about White Coat when I interviewed my friend Bill Cork in an Avenist History Extra episode, which you can listen to by subscribing at AvenistHistoryPodcast.org or by becoming a patron on Patreon.com. Now, let's bring this all together. This story of the Avenist Church in the Vietnam War has been American-focused. I admit it. I'd love to have more time to focus on how the rest of the world saw things, but from what I've gleaned in a brief survey of Avenist literature around the world, Avenist publications were pretty united on the priorities of helping the humanitarian and missionary work in Vietnam and then helping the Avenist servicemen stationed there. On the first front, the Vietnam War presented a remarkable opportunity for the membership to be informed. There were constant reports of the work going on in Vietnam. The number of lives saved at Saigon Avenus Hospital and the exciting mission stories of people who experienced a miracle in the jungle, like running into the Viet Cong and getting a three-hour lecture, but somehow living to tell the tale. Missionaries were also always returning from Vietnam, speaking at churches. Photos showed Adventists around the world when new churches were being built in Vietnam, what they looked like, where they were located, some of the members who worshipped there. Avenist soldiers wrote letters that got printed in student newspapers as well as the major periodicals, and I don't think that there's ever been a better informed Adventist readership, and yet, of course, they were only selectively informed. Most Adventists would have been completely ignorant that perhaps hundreds and hundreds of Adventists, maybe thousands, did carry guns. They sometimes just listed themselves as Protestants when registering so the church might not find out. But overall, you could be proud of your church and the work it was accomplishing despite the war. Adventist missionaries, local Vietnamese Adventists, were extremely brave and undaunted by the challenge that was before them. Perhaps one of the more enduring innovations of the Vietnam War was the creation of these medevac units of helicopters, referred to as flying dust-off back then. They would swoop down, pick up the wounded, carry them away, and take them to a hospital, saving perhaps thousands of lives. And that was better than what Americans faced back home, where the nation's new highways during the 1960s saw tens of thousands of deaths each and every year. In 1970, a partnership between the military and civilians meant that military medevac could be called in to help carry wounded motorists to hospitals. It helped the pilots stay sharp, and it helped, of course, the civilians get medical care. And these helicopters and their crews would later be privatized as it exists today. Today, hospitals own the helicopters and send out those crews. But that procedure, that medevac model, was invented in Vietnam. And chances are that the medic on the helicopter in Vietnam would be a Seventh-day Adventist. They were many of the first flight nurses, so to speak. Vietnam was also a place for a new Adventist ministry to spread its wings, the so-called Seventh-day Adventist Welfare Service. Of course, welfare ministry wasn't new in the church, but this latest welfare organization received U.S. government aid to work in Vietnam and help with basic needs there. It would later change its name after the war. Then again, it would change its name in 1983 when it became known by the acronym ADRA. After U.S. troops left Vietnam, the church remained, even if some members like the Vans escaped to the United States. The army, which had taken over the Adventist Hospital in Saigon, gave it back. The church somehow had grown incredibly throughout the war. It was a place where Adventists, both Vietnamese and foreign, had tried to help the Vietnamese people through literature distribution and especially medical assistance. A team from Loma Linda had performed more than 60 heart surgeries at Saigon Adventist Hospital, apparently the first heart surgeries done in Vietnam. Student missionaries gave thousands of vaccinations to kids in orphanages, perhaps saving hundreds or thousands of lives. Now, fast forward. After the Waco siege of 1993, where several members of a group led by David Koresh had ultimately perished after a months-long siege, the media began to associate Koresh and his crew with Seventh-day Adventists because 
Most of the hundred-plus people who perished at Waco had formerly been Seventh-day Adventists and even retained some Adventist teachings. Perhaps surprisingly, some other Christians came to Adventism's defense to insist that Koresh was not what a Seventh-day Adventist looked like. An Orthodox priest named Anthony Ugolnik wrote to the New York Times to insist that Adventists were not part of what he called a similar cultic trend as Koresh. Quote, As a priest of the Orthodox Church who writes on religion and culture, I am hardly a missionary for the Seventh-day Adventists. In the Vietnam War, however, I served as an army medic with many SDAs, as they were called, vegetarian, cheerful, stolidly faithful to their tradition. They were harassed mercilessly by drill instructors who routinely insulted their beliefs. Their casualty rates were among the highest of the war. But their memory is seared into those hapless cynics who served with them. They were the bravest, most committed, most heroic Americans I have ever known." End quote. Anthony Ogolnik is a really interesting person. He's a Vietnamese historian, a medieval scholar, ice hockey coach, but he was no prophet. For he went on to predict, quote, I guarantee that Hollywood or the secular press will never tell their story as a counterweight to people like David Koresh, end quote. Well, my friend, we did get Hacksaw Ridge in a number of versions of the Desmond Doss story. So there's that. Let's wrap up this episode with the final line of Father Anthony's letter to the New York Times. Quote, but to honor the memory of those whose faith led them to die rather than take up arms, we can spare Seventh-day Adventists in condemnation of cults. End quote. For Father Anthony, the whole cult issue that has plagued Adventism for a century wasn't an issue of Adventist Christology or the inspiration of Ellen White. They risked their lives in Vietnam and stayed true to their principles even to death. What further argument do you need that they were followers of Christ? Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.